April 1962. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev is walking near his villa on the Black Sea. He looks across the water. On the far shore is Turkey, where, months before, President Kennedy had stationed nuclear missiles. Their warheads threaten Moscow. And he wonders, why then can't we do the same in Cuba? And the world slips one minute closer to midnight. This Cold War series is brought to you by Dominations. If you want to get your Khrushchev on, check out the link in the description. Remember when we did that Berlin airlift episode? Well, the folks at Dominations wanted to keep this Cold War party going, so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, a time when, for 13 days, two great powers hurtled toward a global suicide pact. And it started with a bluff. Following the launch of Sputnik in 1957, Khrushchev had regularly bragged to foreign press about the Soviet missile system. His rockets could hit a fly 8,000 miles away, he said, and Moscow was cranking them out like sausages. In reality, though, his intercontinental missiles were super inaccurate and took hours to launch. In the event of a war, they'd probably be destroyed while fueling, meaning that they weren't much of a deterrent against an American first strike. These long-range missiles were little more than an empty threat. But Khrushchev did have reliable medium and intermediate-range missiles, and if he could station those in Cuba, he could credibly threaten the United States, in much the same way NATO had encircled and threatened the Soviet Union. From that position of power, he could probably negotiate for Berlin, or demand that Kennedy withdraw his missiles from Turkey. And, as a bonus, the U.S. would never again dare to invade Cuba. But deploying them openly was not an option. Couldn't risk Kennedy doing something rash. No, Khrushchev would have to sneak them in, and only unveil them once they were operational. It would be a checkmate, provided the secret held. On an undisclosed date in Havana, Fidel Castro sits in his office. The man across from him, traveling undercover as an agricultural engineer, is the head of Soviet rocket forces. And he's just offered to deploy nuclear missiles in Cuba. Castro is skeptical. If the Yankees discover a secret deployment, they'll think that the missiles are intended for a first strike. Besides, Cuba doesn't need nuclear weapons, and he wants to look like a Soviet ally, not a puppet. Wouldn't a defense treaty be better? The Russian says, no, these weapons will counteract imperialist aggression, protecting both nations. Castro withdraws to confer, and then delivers his answer. Cuba will help defend world revolution. Khrushchev will have his Caribbean fortress. On August 25th in Sevastopol, a timber freighter pulls out of port, riding high on the water. Deep in its hold lie medium-range rockets, so long that they have to be propped up against a bulkhead. It's only one of 85 commercial ships ferrying troops and equipment to Cuba. The luckiest of these soldiers travel on cruise ships disguised as tourists, but the majority are crammed into sweltering freighters. By early September, the missiles begin arriving. And they're not alone. 42,000 Soviet troops come ashore, dressed in civilian clothes or Cuban army uniforms. They unload their cargoes by night. Helicopters, bombers, patrol boats, anti-aircraft guns, fighter jets, and medium-range ballistic missiles. The work begins. On October 16th, at 11.50 a.m. in the Oval Office, President Kennedy and a handful of advisors sit at the briefing table, looking at blown-up photos from a U-2 spy plane. A CIA analyst lays it out. These are medium-range missiles with a range of 1,174 miles. If one launches, it can hit Washington in 13 minutes. Kennedy is furious at Khrushchev's betrayal. The midterms are coming up, and his political rivals have made the Soviet buildup in Cuba a campaign issue. They accuse him of letting the Soviets install missile platforms 90 miles from Florida. Privately, Khrushchev had told Kennedy that the buildup was defensive, meant to avoid another American invasion, and that it wouldn't include missiles. With this assurance in hand, Kennedy had drawn a red line, pledging to take action if the Soviets stationed nuclear weapons in Cuba. He had made that pledge, thinking that he'd never have to go through with it. When will they be operational? Kennedy asks. The analyst replies, once the warheads are attached, within hours. The defense secretary cuts in. If there's going to be an airstrike, it must happen before the missiles are operational. But there is evidence that the warheads aren't on site yet. He thinks that Kennedy still has time to plan. 
but the chairman of the Joint Chiefs disagrees. Most of the rocket infrastructure is already in place. He thinks that the president should either order an airstrike, or maybe an airstrike followed by an invasion. We are certainly going to do option one, says Kennedy. We are going to take out those missiles. They reconvene that night. At 6.30 p.m. in the White House, gathered around in the cabinet room are 14 men, nine from the National Security Council, and five other key experts. It's the first meeting of what will be known as the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, or XCOM. Kennedy secretly turns on a tape recorder, preserving the meeting. The Joint Chiefs state their unanimous position. An airstrike on the missile sites won't work. Khrushchev could just send more missiles to replace the destroyed ones, and Soviet bombers in Cuba could still hit Florida. They recommend 800 sorties destroying all Soviet power on the island, followed by an invasion. Kennedy's brother, Bobby, the Attorney General, loves this plan, because he hates Castro. But the others point out that airstrikes are never 100% effective. Some Russian missiles might survive it and launch a counterstrike. And, of course, if Soviet soldiers are manning the missiles, killing them in an airstrike could lead to war. The Secretary of State asks whether doing nothing is an option. After all, those missiles don't really change the strategic balance. Is getting nuked from Cuba any different than getting nuked from Russia? Kennedy agrees it isn't. But he had pledged to take action, and if he reneges, Khrushchev might see it as weakness and start sending missiles to hotspots everywhere. So three plans are developed. First, diplomacy. Low chance of success, but low risk of war also. Second, instituting a naval blockade to stop any more weapons from coming in, and calling for the missile's removal. Publicly warn that any offensive move against the U.S. would lead to a nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. Third, an airstrike with an optional invasion. XCOM goes back and forth, debating possible outcomes. But Kennedy keeps coming back to Khrushchev's thinking. Why would he do this? It would be like the U.S. putting missiles in Turkey. Um, we did, points out the National Security Advisor. On October 17th, at 12 p.m. in the Caribbean, 40 U.S. warships plunge toward a tiny island. The Marines inside check their weapons. Soon they'll storm ashore and remove the island's dictator. It's just an exercise, one that was scheduled before the crisis. But in Washington, XCOM is still discussing whether they'll do this for real. On October 19th at 9.45 a.m. in the White House, the new intelligence reports are ominous. Fresh U-2 photos show two medium-range missiles are now operational. The Soviets are also building several launch sites for intermediate-range missiles that can hit almost all of the continental U.S. Those missiles aren't ready yet, but the decision window is closing. In the last several days, discussions in XCOM have increasingly turned away from the airstrike invasion option. Even Bobby has come around on that one. The blockade, at least, leaves room to negotiate. But the Joint Chiefs still push for war. Kennedy expresses his biggest concern. If he attacks Cuba, Khrushchev will attack Berlin, and that'll leave only one alternative. A nuclear strike. The Air Force Chief of Staff pushes back. If it came to it, they could wipe out the Soviets. Besides, a blockade will communicate weakness. He compares it to Nazi appeasement, which is a shot at Kennedy's father, who once advocated negotiating with Hitler. But Kennedy knows that winning a nuclear war might still mean millions of American deaths. The general responds that the Air Force will be ready for an attack in two days, if ordered. These brass hats have one advantage, Kennedy says after the meeting. If we listen to them, none of us will be alive later to tell them they were wrong. He needs to make a decision. On October 20th at 9 a.m. in Cuba, the 79th Missile Regiment gathers around a political officer. He stands on a mound of dirt brought from the Soviet Union, a reminder that these men are here to defend their homeland. He makes an announcement. Their eight medium-range missiles are combat ready. We may die martyrs, he says, but we won't abandon Cuba to the imperialists. His troops applaud. On October 22nd at 10 p.m. in the Kremlin, Khrushchev has received intelligence reports of unusual activity all over the U.S. Congressmen are apparently boarding Air Force jets back to Washington. Naval maneuvers are happening in the Caribbean, and civilians are evacuating Guantanamo Bay. Kennedy is scheduled to broadcast a television address at 2 a.m. Moscow time. The U.S. Embassy has told him to expect a communication an hour before. Khrushchev calls a meeting of the Presidium, the highest committee of the Communist Party. The missiles have been discovered, he says. An invasion of Cuba is imminent. 
He runs through his options, from announcing a mutual defense pact with Cuba over the radio, to transferring the missiles to Cuban control and letting them defend their own country. The best course, he says, is to disallow Soviet troops from using the long-range missiles, but permit them to use their short-range tactical nuclear weapons in the event of an invasion. His defense minister, Malinovsky, cuts in. Putting that decision in the hand of commanders might accidentally precipitate a conflict. He suggests waiting for Kennedy's message. It arrives an hour before Kennedy's broadcast. Not an invasion, but an ultimatum. There'll be no war tonight, but also no sleep. Because there are 14 Soviet freighters inbound for Cuba right now. One carries nuclear warheads three times more powerful than all the bombs ever dropped in history. And it is heading toward an American blockade. This episode was brought to you by Dominations. Click the link in the description to play the game for free. It's October 22nd, 7 p.m. Camera equipment clutters the Oval Office. Three, two, one. The president is live, announcing to 100 million Americans that there are nuclear weapons in Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The U.S. military goes to DEFCON 3. Missiles and bombers can launch within 15 minutes of a presidential order. The clock ticks another minute toward midnight. This Cold War series is brought to you by Dominations. If you want to get your Khrushchev on, check out the link in the description. Around the world, troops are going on the alert. In Cuba, Castro sounds the mobilization, calling up 300,000 troops to defend the island. He dispatches Che Guevara to prepare for a guerrilla war. His brother Raul surrounds Guantanamo Bay with artillery. A hundred miles away in Florida, 120,000 servicemen gather in an invasion force nearly as large as the one deployed on D-Day. 600 aircraft clog the runways. Troops sleep in football stadiums. A cargo plane crashes on the tarmac at Guantanamo Bay. Its immolated crewmen are the first deaths in a conflict that could kill millions. In Moscow, the Presidium is buckling down for an all-night meeting. First, Khrushchev issues a statement calling this so-called quarantine an illegal act of piracy. He knows that the term's a rhetorical dodge. Kennedy can't call it a blockade because that would be an act of war. But illegal or not, Khrushchev orders his missile freighters to turn back toward the Soviet Union. He can't risk them being boarded. The other freighters, the ones delivering food and fuel, will continue on. Let Kennedy inspect those, it'll only embarrass him. Their submarine escorts will hold position just outside the quarantine, ready to move in case war breaks out. One freighter, Khrushchev decides, should steam on ahead as planned. Kennedy has delayed the quarantine a day in order to seek international support, and in that time, the freighter full of warheads can still make Cuba. It pulls into a rural port just before dawn. Soviet troops carefully unload its cargo and distribute it to the holding bunkers. Cuba's missiles now have teeth. At 12.05 p.m., six U.S. Navy jets take off from Florida, tearing over Cuba at a thousand feet. They are low-level reconnaissance craft, meant to provide detailed pictures of the missile sites. On the ground below, Cuban anti-aircraft crews are unnerved and itching to strike back. Were those recon aircraft or strike fighters? Were their positions currently being marked for elimination? At 7.06 p.m., Kennedy officially signs the quarantine authorization, but there's a problem. XCOM is still debating how the Navy will enforce it. The Navy thinks it's simple. They will challenge every ship to stop for inspection. If the ship doesn't stop, they'll fire star shells. If it still doesn't respond, they'll disable its rudder and board it. If they encounter a submarine, they'll use practice depth charges to force it to surface. 
Hearing this, Kennedy goes white. Firing on Soviet ships could start a battle. A battle could lead to a war, and a war might mean nuclear annihilation. He dispatches the Secretary of Defense to keep watch over the Navy's war room. There must be no shooting. The Navy was treating this quarantine as if it was their objective to sink ships, but this operation should be meant to communicate with Khrushchev. This isn't whack-a-mole, it's sign language with destroyers. That night, Robert Kennedy sneaks into the side door of the Soviet embassy. It's a back channel that the Kennedys have used before. Robert asks if the Soviet ships will stop when challenged. The ambassador, uninformed about the missiles and with no orders from Moscow, says that they will not. And furthermore, stopping them will be an act of war. On October 24th at 10 a.m., the first suspected weapons freighter is scheduled to hit the quarantine line in minutes. XCOM anxiously waits for news. Then, a message. The Soviet missile freighters have turned back. We're eyeball to eyeball, says the Secretary of State, and I think the other fellow just blinked. Little do they know, there was no showdown. The freighters had turned back 30 hours ago. CIA analysts wanted to be certain before passing on the information, and naval signals traffic is so busy right now, even emergency messages are taking four hours to get through. The closest Soviet weapons freighter halted 500 miles away from the interception point. But ships are still coming. In Omaha, Strategic Air Command orders the nuclear force to DEFCON 2. 145 missiles stand at the ready. 23 bombers circle outside Soviet airspace, each with enough firepower to level four cities. It's 5.15 in the Kremlin. Khrushchev has privately decided that there cannot, under any circumstances, be a war. But buckling to U.S. pressure could destroy him politically. He needs to walk away from this with a win. He proposes a new strategy. Withdraw the missiles in return for Kennedy's promise never to invade Cuba. The Presidium agrees to this. He drafts a letter outlining the deal and dispatches it to the U.S. Embassy. It will take eight hours to arrive. On October 25th at 5 p.m., the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. is famously quiet and careful, but Kennedy has made clear what needs to happen. The Soviets are still denying that the missiles exist. He has to go hard and hold their ambassador to account on television. Do you deny that the USSR has placed missiles in Cuba? Asks the ambassador. Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? I am not in an American courtroom, argues the Soviet ambassador. The US will have their reply later. I am prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, the ambassador answers. He raises blown up photographs of the missile sites and lays out his evidence. On October 26th, at 1 a.m. in Minnesota, a sentry guarding a radar station sees the silhouette of a man trying to climb the fence. He fires into the darkness and raises a sabotage alarm. It's happening. A Soviet commando raid. Pilots across the Midwest scramble into their cockpits. But the alarm is canceled just before the first takeoff. It's a false alarm. A bear had wandered into the wire. At 7.50 a.m., the U.S. Navy boards the first vessel passing the quarantine line. Now, this is a bit of political theater. Kennedy has purposely chosen a Lebanese freighter with a Greek crew for his first inspection. There is zero chance of it actually carrying nuclear weapons. But it does get the message across. Ships will be stopped. At 12 p.m., the CIA briefs XCOM. Low-level reconnaissance has discovered something new. Soviet cruise missiles, probably nuclear. They're positioned near Guantanamo Bay and the coast. Any U.S. invasion will probably be met with a tactical nuclear strike. U.S. generals ask for clearance to use their own tactical nukes. In Cuba, Castro's losing patience. He's annoyed that Khrushchev ordered the freighters to return and furious that the Soviet ambassador is still denying the existence of missiles in Cuba. And most of all, he has had it with the reconnaissance flights. He's held fire so far to preserve diplomatic efforts, but his spies in the U.S. are reporting that an attack may come as soon as tonight. These planes are violating Cuban sovereignty, scouting for an invasion, maybe even preparing for a surprise airstrike. He drafts a letter to the U.N. threatening defensive fire against any violation of Cuban airspace. At 6 p.m., Khrushchev's proposed deal finally arrives at the White House. The letter is long and rambling, which is why it took so long to translate, encrypt, and send. It pleads against a war. 
Kennedy wants to take this deal, but the press, stonewalled by the White House and seizing on statements by a bureaucrat, is reporting that an invasion of Cuba is imminent. If the Soviets believe them, war may break out before he can accept. On October 27th at 6 a.m., Castro has been at the Soviet embassy all night, trying to draft a statement. He thinks that the U.S. will invade at any moment, and that will inevitably trigger nuclear war. But he keeps vacillating on what he wants Khrushchev to do about it. Finally, the frustrated ambassador asks, Are you recommending a first strike, yes or no? Yes, he says. In the event of a U.S. invasion, the USSR must launch. Cuba will be martyred, but the global revolution will survive. Meanwhile, in the White House, Kennedy is ordering more recon flights, despite Castro's warning. CIA reports indicate that the missiles are now operational. If one launches, it will hit New York or Washington in 10 minutes. There is zero room for error. One slip might mean the end of humanity. At 11.16 a.m., Soviet troops pick up a high-altitude plane over Cuba. It's probably a U-2, and it's been photographing their positions in depth for an hour. Their surface-to-air missiles can knock it out, and their general has issued orders to shoot down airspace violators. They call him for confirmation, but he's asleep. So, they launch. 72,000 feet above, Major Anderson is listening to his U-2's camera traversing back and forth. Thunk, thunk. Thunk, thunk. Then, a warning siren. An indicator goes red. He tries to evade, the fragile plane creaking as he banks. Then, there's an explosion. Shrapnel rattles through the fuselage. Helmet glass shatters, and then, depressurized silence. Debris falls on the green fields of Cuba. And now, it is a shooting war. This episode was brought to you by Domination. October 27th, 3.35 a.m. The bomber lets go. A flash lights the Arctic Circle. Shockwaves tear outward with the power of 20 Hiroshima bombs. Radioactive ash collects on the barren island below. A Soviet atmospheric test scheduled before the crisis. In Cuba, Soviet troops are transporting warheads to the missile sites. They and the American troops in Florida are prepared for an invasion. At the quarantine line, Soviet subs play cat and mouse with American destroyers. At noon, America conducts its own test. A mushroom cloud rises 60,000 feet over the Pacific. Thus dawns Black Saturday, the day mankind came closest to nuclear destruction. The clock sits at 11.59. This Cold War series is brought to you by Dominations. If you want to get your Khrushchev on, check out the link in the description. 11.59 a.m. A U-2 pilot searches the horizon. He had taken off eight hours before to collect air samples from the Soviet atmospheric test. But this close to magnetic north, all navigation is celestial, and the northern lights have wiped the sky clean. He has had to guess his way back to Alaska, and something about the ground below looks off somehow. Little does he know, Soviet jets lurk 15,000 feet below him, ready to strike when he descends. He's just flown into the Soviet Union. At the White House, XCOM is at the end of their rope. They'd nearly agreed to accept Khrushchev's deal, pledging never to invade Cuba in exchange for Russia dismantling the missiles. But two hours ago, Radio Moscow broadcast a new deal. Khrushchev also wants U.S. missiles withdrawn from Turkey. The new Soviet position is tough because, well, because it's so reasonable. Missiles for missiles. It would go down well at the UN. Kennedy leans toward accepting. The missiles are obsolete and due for withdrawal anyway. But the Hawks revolt. This will break NATO. It's trading away an ally's safety for our own. Rival factions in XCOM begin drafting their own responses to the offer. Meanwhile, the generals are preparing for air sorties in Cuba, starting Monday. Kennedy convinces them to delay until Tuesday, but time for diplomacy is running out. Then, they hear that a U-2 is overdue from Cuba. At 1 p.m., generals are rushing to put the U.S. nuclear force on full alert. In the event of war, they need everything ready, even if it means cutting corners. Nuclear weapons are supposed to work on the buddy system, where no one man is able to fire. But in the chaos, that's waived. Single-seat jets are equipped with tactical nukes. 
to get the new Minuteman missiles online, commanders jury-rig a solution that bypasses safety protocols. If an error occurs, the Minutemen will launch within 30 seconds. At 2.25 p.m., the lost U-2 pilot, out of fuel, finally glides into a rural airstrip in Alaska. For two hours, a navigator has been carefully guiding him in by radio. Only then does he learn that his excursion over the USSR lit up every Soviet air defense system in the sector. MiGs hunted him the whole time, thinking he was preparing for a bombing run. His legs give out. At 4.20 p.m., XCOM is beginning to question everything. Why did Khrushchev offer two deals in 24 hours? In fact, how do they know they're negotiating with Khrushchev at all? The tones of the messages were pretty different. What if there was a coup and the Red Army has taken over? They're going in circles now. Then they hear the news. The overdue U-2 isn't coming back. The Soviets shot it down. Escalation. At 5.50 p.m., Khrushchev phones his family. A car is coming to pick them up. They're going to the vacation house. Don't ask questions. The U-2 shootdown has shaken him to his core. Who ordered it? He'd told Soviet troops to defend themselves, not fire on unarmed planes. And Castro had sent that crazy letter, urging a first strike on the United States. Were Soviet troops now following Cuban orders? And if so, would the next unauthorized launch be nuclear? He gets a report. A U-2 violated Soviet airspace. Kennedy is pushing this too far. It's 6.30 p.m. For two days, an American destroyer has played cat and mouse with a Soviet sub, and now they've finally caught it. For a half hour, they've signaled it with grenades. No response. Now it's time to roll out something bigger. Practice depth charges. Moscow knew that the U.S. Navy would use this signal, but no one told the submarine crews. Below, the captain of the B-59 is going mad. The sub's cooling system is broken. It's 130 degrees in there. Drained batteries force the crew to live in the dark. Unable to surface while being pursued, they haven't talked to Moscow in 48 hours. They have no idea if there's a war on. And the grenades. It sounds like someone beating the hull with a sledgehammer. And then, wham! That was a depth charge. The war has started. There's no other explanation. The captain gives the order. Load the nuclear torpedo. If his crew's gonna perish, they're gonna take the American fleet with them. At 7.30 p.m., XCOM has outlived its usefulness. Kennedy withdraws with a small corps of advisors to try and figure out how to accept the missile swap while still preserving NATO. And they've got a plan. First, they'll send a public letter agreeing to Khrushchev's first offer. The U.S. will never invade Cuba. Bobby will deliver that letter to the Soviet ambassador, along with a second secret offer. Half an hour later, the ambassador is shocked at Kennedy's demeanor. Bobby has always been eager to pick fights, but now he's empty of bluster. Time is of the essence, Kennedy says. The military wants retribution for the U-2. We can accept the non-invasion pledge publicly, but we can't make an open trade for the Turkish missiles. But take the deal, he says, and the missiles will be gone in five months. And by the way, if this conversation leaks, the deal's off. The ambassador leaves at a run. It's 9.52 p.m. Wham. Another depth charge. It's now or never. They are gonna vaporize as much of the American Navy as they can. Normally, two men have to agree to fire B-59's nuclear torpedo, the captain and the political officer. They have both voted yes. But aboard this submarine is a third man, the flotilla commander Vasily Arkhipov, and he also gets a vote. Wham. An argument breaks out on deck. Arkhipov votes no. Wham. They need to surface and get orders from Moscow. It might end their careers, but it might also save the world. The captain calms, his moment of fury passing. It will be good, at least, to breathe fresh air again. B-59 surfaces surrounded by four American destroyers. Its ragged crew, which has traveled further than any Soviet sub in history, defiantly unveils the red banner of the Soviet Union. October 28th. It's morning in Moscow. Khrushchev has moved the Presidium to a vacation house outside the city. He can tell they are judging him for creating this mess. Reports are coming in fast. The KGB swears war is imminent. He's still trying to figure out who ordered Soviet troops to shoot down that U-2, and to decipher what message Kennedy was trying to send with the airspace violation. Then, Robert Kennedy's deal arrives. Khrushchev reads it out, 
The Presidium approves. Diplomats rush to cobble together a message, while Khrushchev composes a letter trying to calm Castro. Russian police halt all traffic as a car rushes the announcement to Radio Moscow. Things are developing so quickly, they're worried war could break out on the car ride. A broadcast goes out. The missiles are leaving, and the crisis is over. XCOM celebrates. Castro trashes his office. Khrushchev finally gets some sleep. These leaders had begun the crisis thinking of politics as a chessboard, a game of moves and counter moves. But by the end, they realized almost too late that they weren't moving chess pieces. They were throwing dice. They could place bets, but it was luck as much as skill that kept them from war. A recon photo finding a missile, a U-2 straying into enemy territory, a submarine officer voting no. The crisis was over, but the gambling would continue, even as, one by one, these men who saved the world were removed from it. While the U.S.'s non-invasion pledge secured Castro's hold on power, his volatility during the crisis marginalized him with his Soviet allies. Cuba would never again wield such influence on the world stage. Kennedy helped cool U.S.-Soviet relations. He negotiated a test ban treaty and established a hotline so that the president could talk with a Soviet premier directly without delay. He was starting to plan a new meeting with Khrushchev in 1963 when he stepped off Air Force One in Dallas. Kennedy would be carried back aboard that plane. In his absence, a dangerous myth grew. Most of XCOM never knew about the missile swap. They thought iron-willed diplomacy backed by military force had won the day. And if it worked with the mighty Soviet Union, mightn't it work on a small country like Vietnam? In 1964, the Presidium ousted Khrushchev, citing his poor decisions, including the missile deployment. He retired to write his memoirs, an old man with no influence. The new leadership immediately began turning out long-range missiles to compete with the U.S. arsenal. Robert Kennedy wrote a book about the crisis. He served in the Senate and ran for president in 1968. He supported de-escalating the Cold War, especially in Vietnam. After winning the California primary, he stopped to shake hands with a hotel employee who'd brought meals up to his room. An assassin shot him three times. The handshake turned into an embrace. The young man kept Kennedy's head off the floor and put a rosary in his hand. Is everybody okay? Kennedy asked. One of his eyes closed, his leg was twitching. He tried to comfort the man who held him. Everything's going to be okay. The Cold War continued for another 23 years. As of 2018, the clock is at two minutes to midnight. <laughs>